We were isolated. We truly were far-flung colonials at the bottom of the world. That which reached us was often enough on newsreels in cinemas. I mean, we tended to get everything late and we tended to really be out of the mainstream of the world. We sensed there was something incredibly exciting happening in the top half of the world that the young had somehow taken over. But until the arrival of the Beatles, we had no way of really feeling that, of knowing what it was really all about. The Beatles were like this sort of sign from above. They were a skewer to lance the boil of stifling conservatism. And it changed us completely because we had nothing beyond a few mag representations in magazines and on the screen, no means of understanding what this tumult was all about until 350,000 people went out in the streets of Adelaide. 250,000 people went out in the streets of Melbourne. And the importance of it was that it was a liberating force. There's no question about that. But in 1964, for a 16-year-old to stand in a public thoroughfare and against the instructions of people in uniform scream at the top of their voices, was the most extraordinarily liberating and powerful experience that could be imagined. The world didn't change when the Royal Tour happened, but the world did change from Australia's perspective when the Beatles happened, because, like I said, I use the word again, it was a liberating situation. Nothing survived the arrival of the Beatles musically. Certainly all the sort of the pretty bandstand era sort of solo pop stars, whether it was, you know, Cole Joy or Judy Stone and Lonnie Lee and people like that, they had trouble surviving it. But also even the new surf combos like the Atlantics who were, you know, crisp and sharp and on the money, they were even swept aside. For a time there, it had to be four or possibly five you know, people playing their own instruments, self-contained. Self the singer had to be not separate, it had to be one of the band. Um, it, it, it had to be in the British mould. I mean, the thing about the Beatles when they were here for, for the young fans, that this was sort of an escape from the muzzle of school, parents and stifling community standards. This was a chance to really, you know, well, let your hair down literally by that, by that stage. So the bands in Australia that came out of the migrant hostels, almost always British, um, for whom you know, the Beatles were something that were almost peers and contemporaries, not something to be frightened of, for them, well, yeah, that was, this was a big continent that gave them the opportunity to get out and roar and storm and yell and scream and stomp and terrify you know, the mayor whose daughter was probably in the dressing room with them. And <laughs> it, it was much madness and much, much craziness. Again, the source remains the, Beatle, the Beatles tour. It changed us dramatically. After the Beatles' Australian tour, you would have thought it would have become a benchmark. You thought it would have, it, it would have been you know, seen as the high watermark of Beatlemania. But in fact, it was the opposite. The most you would get in a, in a, a rock encyclopedia or anything, a documentary, would be one line. June 1964, Far East tour. That was it. The fact that we had the biggest crowds of all um, and you know, the greatest hysteria was just ignored and I'm always puzzled by it. When they arrived in New York for the first time, um, early in 1964, there was about 5,000 people to meet them and it made headlines all around the world. It was considered an astonishing thing. Four, five months later, they're arriving in Adelaide to 350,000 people. Where were the global headlines? Who even knew Australia existed, let alone who was going to give them credit 
for welcoming the Beatles in a manner that had never occurred and frankly would never occur again. So it remained a secret. I mean, when I actually wrote this book, I wrote it simply because of a frustration that this incredible event in our lives, but really in sort of in a global sense, had gone unremarked, had gone un undocumented. And um, it's still, you'd be hard put to find anybody in the top half of the world who could tell you, if asked, um, where the biggest crowds for the Beatles occurred. There's a photograph, it's one of the great photographs of the 60s. It's Melbourne Airport and there's this man looking a little sort of forlorn, a little lost, sitting there on his own in a departure lounge waiting to get back home and resume a relatively normal life because the life he'd led before that, for the couple of weeks before that, was certainly not normal. Jimmy Nickel had been a drummer for Georgie Fames, Blue Flames, and a few others. He was a bit jazzish, um, and on very short notice, he was called upon to fill in for Ringo, um, who had tonsillitis and had to be hospitalised. He only played in four cities, and um, he came to Australia from Hong Kong, and we only got to see him in Adelaide. But, and I'm sure this will be in his mind for whatever's left of his life, he was part of the greatest Beatle event of all time. I mean, is it? And he always looked a little lost. He always looked a little bit sort of, you know, out of sorts. I think actually all credit to Jimmy. I mean, he filled in, it wasn't just filling in for a gig, it wasn't just playing uh, drums on a bunch of songs. It was the fact is he was in he was in the press conferences. He was actually in the back of the cars, waving to the crowd. He did fulfil the role of being the Beatle, you know, the, whether it's a replacement or not. I don't think he likes the fact that the only thing he's remembered for um, is being sort of you know, a Beatle for a moment.